Hello and welcome to the Everything Is Black and White podcast. It's time for the match preview with me, Andrew Musgrove and John Gibson. Tottenham Hotspur, the visitors to St. James's Park for another 12.30 kickoff. And it's another crucial game in Newcastle's race for Europe. Spurs currently fourth on 60 points, Newcastle down in eighth on 47 points. It's going to be another exciting game, I would say, because both teams do like to score a few goals. Both have scored 65 this season, so if you're a betting man or woman, you might be putting a couple of quid on a high-scoring game. Newcastle coming to this one on the back of a victory over Fulham. Wasn't pretty, but it was effective. Spurs coming to this one, having beaten Nottingham Forest 3-1. Some would say, well, they're fortunate circumstances, and we'll get onto that later in the show. First off, John, how are you doing? You keeping well? I'm good. I'm a lot better after the last week of Newcastle United. Seven seven points out of nine has revived the charge for you considerably. I was going to say, is seven points out of nine, you know, a good thing now? Is is that point against Everton look a bit, looking a better point because of the victory over Fulham? Without a shadow of doubt, without that victory over Fulham, it would have been costly. Normally, in a way, draws acceptable. A normal pattern of things, every coach tells every club and every team, is win your home games and at least draw away. Um, but because we only drew with Everton, the onus was on us. We had to win at Fulham. A draw wouldn't have been good enough because we're in a catch-up situation. But seven points out of nine... You know, before that week started, we'd have said, win my two games at St. James's and get a draw at Fulham, and we've done quite well. We've managed that. It's going to be a heck of a game because Spurs have gone into the top four for the first time in weeks into a Champions League spot. So they've got an awful lot to play for. We've got an awful lot to play for. It's set up nicely. It certainly is. And if you look at the form... Uh, Spurs have lost just once in the last five, but so have Newcastle. And in those one of games, it's actually the same game um, out of the five that they lost. So they're coming to this in exactly the same form. It's very hard to predict what's going to happen on Saturday. I've been saying for the last few weeks, John, I've just come to expect absolutely nothing from Newcastle. United. So therefore, I can't be disappointed. I can't be surprised. I just go in thinking, let's try and enjoy this afternoon because... I just don't know, as you said last week, you don't know what to expect from Newcastle. They no. were shocking against Fulham for the first half and now either then, you would, some would argue, still rode their luck a little bit. Uh, Fulham had the chances uh, to get back into the game or to take the lead. Spurs are, I would say, a little bit like Newcastle. Okay, they're miles ahead on the table, but they're also, you never quite know what you're going to get from them. Yes, they're in a good run of form, but they do uh, concede a few goals. They can drop off um, in, in in the second half. They can also dominate games like they did in the second half against Nottingham Forest. So you can't quite predict what you're going to get from them. What did you take from the Fulham game uh, and what can you take from it into Saturday's game against Tottenham? Yeah, um, I thought both those both the games at the week uh, at the weekend there were very much the same. I mean, as our game at Fulham, I thought Spurs, which who I watched play first, were poor early doors, and then came away much stronger in the second half and got the result they wanted. So they reflected us to a great extent. What I what I take away from Fulham is that I want to play them every week. We've played them three games this season. We've got three wins. We've scored six goals and we've conceded none. Can you believe that with our defence this season, not our defence last season, we haven't conceded a goal in three games against Fulham, which tells us how powder puff they are. And the interesting thing was I did look up the situation, Andrew, because I remember... Eddie saying last season how our form was built on the fact that we had the meanest defence in the Premier League. And he always said that he didn't like to tinker with the back four, hasn't he? You know, he will he will switch things midfield and up top, but he, he wants that understanding in the back four. So try to keep them together, try to keep them together. Well, the three games we've played with Fulham this season... We've had the second-choice goalkeeper in for all three games. Dubrovka, Pope didn't play in any of them. And we're back four, who he likes to keep unchanged. We've had eight different starters in the back four over the three games against um, against Fulham and have kept a clean sheet all the way. I mean, what I took out of that was the fact that uh, Eddie did get into them. 
I mean, um, we played all fall down, didn't we, with people like the broker to make certain that the game was stopped, their flow was stopped, and that he could get into our players on the touchline and say, what the heck are you playing at? What's this? This isn't us. This isn't the way we're supposed to be playing. And it wasn't. We were quite dreadful. And, you know, we looked certain to leak goals uh, early on. What you've got to take out of it is the fact that we came strong and we came away with the result. It would have been more worrying than we on. Had we started strong and tapered off and finished the shambles, you would think that might overflow into the next game. It's better that you finish positively. We were treated by VAR out of a, a, a Shaw's goal because, the, yes, uh, I mean, uh, Burn was all knees and arms and elbows, but he is knees and arms and elbows. That's the way he's built. That's the way he, he, he looks and is. And yes, he, he he was physical going up with their player. But the, the ball didn't go anywhere near either of them. It flew well over the top. It wasn't in the vicinity. And uh, it was beautifully tucked away by, uh, by Shaw. We're now getting games that are being refereed by miles away by people in a rabbit hood somewhere. And, you know... Um, when you've got a referee that's um, just making his way in the Premier League, like we did at Craven Cottage, and not a hugely experienced referee, he's not. Once he's told to go to the Monday, he's not going to go to the Monday and overrule the guys that are sitting in in uh, at headquarters. He's going to go and substantiate. So that that was that, and that might well have been that. But we had the the courage and the conviction and the ability to come back and, and get the goal. What I also took out of it, Andrew, was the fact that we got players onto the park that give us a sense of urgency, give us a sense of freshness, give us a sense of direction. I'm talking about Anderson and Barnes coming on. I was surprised that they didn't start. I mean, the reason why they didn't start, no doubt, is because it was our third game in a week. And there was not a lot in their legs because they hadn't been playing a lot. They'd had a long injury layoff. So Eddie decided not to start them and try to use them as impact subs. Because on their building, on what they had just done, Anderson in the previous game, Barnes with his goals up here, I felt they could have easily started. And I thought when they come on, they added so much more to the team. I mean, the way Anderson with the, the back heel, the blind back heel, on the, on the winner, they took out two of their defenders straight away. Bonds crossed, uh, uh, and the cross caused so much panic, the fella just hooked it out straight to, to Bruno, who finished. Um, I think that those two boys made a big difference to our performance. I thought Willock was given another start and looked what he's looked recently, which is, which is well below the Joe Willock we know in his pump. He looked very average again, and, and regardless of his injury, and I think he will be injured enough not to be able to take part on Saturday, I wouldn't start him in, uh, on Saturday against Spurs. I would start Anderson, and I wouldn't start Murphy. I would play Barnes on the left and Gordon on the right as my only changes. If I could make another change, and I know we're talking about this early on, but we've bled into it. If I could make one more change, if Trippier was fit, Kraft looks short and he, he, he's honest, he's limited, he's honest, he'll give you honesty, he'll give you a, a type of performance, but he is not either Trippier or Livermento. There's no question about that. And so if I could if I could get it right back in, it would be Trippier. Uh, Tino won't be fit and we don't know if Trippier will. I would look at that. But otherwise, I thought Anderson and Bonds had a lot to do with how we turned around. And I would give them a start as a result of that. Yeah, I mean, I've written the, the team down here and it kind of does uh, pick itself really because of that injury to Joe Willick. Ali Anderson has to come in alongside Bruno and Longstaff. And I think the only big question, as you've mentioned there, is who starts out on the right. I think you'll stick with Jacob Murphy. I think you'll keep Barnes on the bench because Barnes is more of an impact player should Newcastle need it. And I guess the, the flip side of that argument would be, well, you want to make your impact straight away so start him that's what he can do but i think anyhow we'll want to have something in his uh weaponry just in case newcastle united needed i don't think you and triple triple will be available 
unless Eddie Howe does what he has done before and he's he, he, he's saying what regularly. Else happens. So we don't know. Um, but from what he said, you take it at face value that he will you, be. You know what I, what I take the point you're making, Andrew, and impact subs and all that. But I'm, I'm, a lot of the time I flip the coin the other way. I want my impact from the start. Yeah. Because if we start slowly, if we start slowly, it takes some picking up, you know. It t- and, and we're not playing Fulham. They said they were playing the fourth top team, Spurs, who incidentally have lost fewer games playing away than they have at home. Did you realise that? They've only lost three away. They've lost four at home. Mind, they won the other 12 at home, which is which is the difference. But they were, they've only lost three away. They're difficult to beat on their travels. I think we've got to start quickly. And when you have a forward line, in my humble opinion, which reads Gordon, Isaac and Barnes, all three can score. All three are goal scorers. And we're going to need, from the start, to get a grip and get among Spurs. If ever we we were told that that's the case, it was last season, for good for goodness sake, when we were three up in 10 minutes and five up in 20 minutes. That was some start. You don't recover from that. I would I would want that start. And I also think that, that as harsh as it is, and Murphy's done well, Bonds is a better player than Murphy. And, and Gordon is a, a better player than Murphy. So Murphy shouldn't start. They should start. That's my logic. I take the impact from the bench. But if you look at it another way, if we are three one down, it's it's a heck of a job making an impact from the bench. The game's lost, you know. And so it it swings in roundabouts. But um, I would certainly start with Barnes. And I think, regardless of Willock's injury, if Willock hadn't been injured, I would have started with Anderson. Yeah, you said that last week, didn't you? But also on the yeah. case that if you're 3-1 down, the game is lost. I mean, why don't you give David Moyes a call and uh, ask him about it? But on... Um, but, but we, yes, but it's it's different. Uh, Spurs, I think, would close yes. the door on with 3-1. Yeah, I mean, on, on Barnes, it, it is really interesting because I think actually one player that needs Barnes on the pitch more than anyone else is, is Alexander Izak because he's the man that gives him the service, that gets him the goals. He's been uh, brilliant, you know, supplying that in the limited appearances we have seen. I guess with Gordon on the right, some would argue that he's not as potent out on the, on the right wing. So do you do you uh, kind of lose a little bit when you move him out from the left? Or do you think that's worth worth a little bit of, of a sacrifice to make sure you get Barnes in because then I the do. team actually improves? I, I do. I mean, there's people, and it included myself, that raised only one eyebrow, a bit like Ancelotti, uh, rather than both eyebrows, when we signed Barnes, because Gordon was a top-class outside left, and we just bought him in January, and then, and then come the summer, we'll buy Barnes effectively for exactly the same position, and you think, oh, two quality players, but how did they both play? Well, you've got to move Gordon, of course. And, you know, even if Almiron was fit, I think Barnes and Gordon are our best two wide players rather than Almiron and Murphy. And um, therefore, I want them both in the team. And Gordon can play on the right, as he can play a false nine. He's a talented boy. And I don't think he loses too much on the right. And the team's better, I think, with Gordon and Barnes in than... than Murphy in, in, in Gordon or Almeron in Gordon when Almeron's fit. I think you've got to get your best players on the park. Not if you're playing them well out of their natural positions, but Gordon can play anywhere along the front line. Uh, and I would, by the way, when we're saying we want Barnes in, etc., let's not forget how good Gordon is, uh, whatever position he plays. And I thought he came back. It Fulham after being off uh, suspended for a game and was terrific again. Um, it was my I man of the match for me, John. Oh, I think he's quality, quality player. And if he goes down by 5% being on the right instead of on the left, that's all. He's still way, way better than Murphy. Yeah. And it'll be interesting to see what the starting 11 is, whether, you know, Keane Trippier is fit despite Howe's words. So we'll wait to see what the team news is on Saturday. You mentioned there uh, how important is Newcastle uh, for, for Newcastle United to start quickly and come out of the traps, and that is my concern because you know we saw against Everton the score early, but then they, they fell away a little bit, and I was Everton to get back in. 
I just don't know what to expect on Saturday. And my, my concern is, is that if Newcastle start like they did against Fulham, Spurs will punish you because, as you say, John, Spurs top four uh, yeah. contenders, some brilliant players, you know, Son, uh, Madison, who's a very lucky boy to, to be uh, available on Saturday after his little punch on the Forest player that didn't get picked up by VAR. But the point being, Spurs will punish Newcastle United. And you also have the added impact of an early goal for Spurs or even just like, you know, a few misplaced passes from Newcastle, the impact that has on the crowd, you know, and that'll be something Spurs will be trying to tap into as well, trying to get the, the crowd, not against Newcastle because they're never against Newcastle, but, you know, a little bit uncomfortable. Yeah. And yeah. I do I do fear a slow start from Newcastle. Well, I, I think it's it's much more important at home, Andrew, than it is away. You can get out of it away, as we did against Fulham. You can pick up your game away. In the, but when you start at home in front of 50,000 Geordies, you start on the front foot, you start at a tempo, you hit Spurs, and the crowd are lifted, and you're almost showboarding, you're almost running down the hill. You start in second gear and the crowd get a little bit of apprehensive and you, you're not doing it and you're going up a hill. So, you know, you can be running down a hill with a great start at St James's or you're running up a hill treading water. And I think the great start at home is very, very important. And I mean, I know it was a ludicrous game, a one-off game, not to be repeated. But I mean, crikey me, in quarter of an hour against Spurs up here last season, the game was over. Um, I mean, that was mind-blowing because, it, you know, three three up in 10 minutes, five up in 20 minutes against Spurs. Are you joking? But no, we weren't joking. Um, and that won't be repeated again. But we don't want to start in second gear against this Spurs side. We don't want to give them any encouragement. We've got to go at them. And, and yes, we've relied on Gordon and, um, and Isaac up front, supported by Bruno, to do that for us. But Anderson will bring something to the table. Barnes will bring something to the table. I don't want them to bring it too late to try to turn a tide. I want them to bring it from the off. And Anderson will have to because of if will it. But uh, um, that's my case for Barnes as well. And Bruno, in truth, has been carrying the midfield, for me, Andrew, on his own. Because Willock hasn't been up to it and Longstaff is not the, the Sean we know. He's, he's not... Having a nightmare, I think Willock's having a greater nightmare. He's not having a nightmare, but he's not hes not the best he is. And therefore, we've relied so much on Bruno. I think Anderson gives some support there to, to Bruno. Bruno's been absolutely terrific. And the fact that he's gone so many games without a booking, uh, he's only got to get through this one. Let's not jinx him by uh, saying too much. But he's only got to get through this one. He avoids his... Um, he avoids his uh, too much suspension. He has been terrifically disciplined. Um, and that's without that discipline taking him anything away from his game. A lot of people say you take the edge off a player's game if you tell him not to stick his foot in, if you tell him to curb his temper, if you tell him to do, he's not as vibrant. He has been as vibrant. And I think while I say, well done, Bruno, you know what else I say? I say, what's the matter with you? Why didn't you do that to start with? If you can control yourself for 10 games, why don't you control yourself from the start of the season and never be in danger of getting booked? Because he obviously can, and I know Eddie's supposed to have had a word with him. Yeah, But just carry that mindset into the start of next season, you know. And, and because a lot of bookings Bruno was getting were through wildness, through stupidity, losing his head doing a stupid foul, taking your shirt off, contesting the throw and throwing the ball away, kicking the ball away, whatever. But a lot of silly bookings, as Anthony Gordon got silly bookings. And, um, you know, well done him. Uh, but let's have that attitude over a season, not just when you're one booking off uh, too much suspension. You know, I agree. And I mentioned yesterday in the latest that was sort of in conversation with Lee Ryder, where we focused on Bruno Gumresh, what he's achieved, his future. I mentioned the fact that I think he's become a better player since he's had to be more disciplined and long may that continue. If you haven't heard the episode, just scroll back on your podcast app. It's on YouTube as well. And take a listen. Let us know what you think about Bruno and his discipline. You mentioned there, uh, John, there, the last year's win at home, 6-1 it was. And I've gone back and I've looked at the team that started that game. And this 
starting eleven and the players who aren't available to be picked this time around, it just reaffirms the injuries that Newcastle United have got. So you had Nick Pope starting in goal, Kieran Trippier at right back, Botman at centre back, Joe Willick in midfield, and Joe Linson uh, out on the left. You also had Lascelles on the bench. You had Wilson on the bench. Uh, Manquillo, but obviously he, he's he's left now. But Newcastle United missing a host of key players that beat Spurs 6-1 last season. Yeah, but I mean, they've lost, they haven't had, they've, they've had a host of players out virtually all season and um, have still got uh, results against the top sides. They've still got seven points out of the last nine. Um, and I think the good thing Eddie does do is he doesn't get the violins out. He doesn't tell you, oh, we are in the position we're in because we've got injuries. He says, well, we, yes, we've got a huge amount of injuries, but we've got to get on with it and it's an opportunity for somebody else. And that's the way to do it. Because players are human beings. They want excuses. If you tell them we are, if we get beat on Saturday, it's only because we can't get a good side out or a full side out. They're half beaten to start with because subconsciously the thing well, if we do get beat, we'll not get hammered either by the boss or hopefully by the crowd or in the press because the boss has already pointed out it's because we're in stum with all the injuries. And you you don't hand excuses to players before balls kick because players are enough of them, not all of them. Players subconsciously put that in their mind. Ah, oh, well, whatever happens on Saturday, we either win and get the plaudits or we lose, but we've only lost because we haven't got half a team out. Um, so don't give them any excuses and there shouldn't be excuses. Our starting 11 should be good enough to give Spurs a game. And we are at home. And we're not lacking confidence. I haven't got seven points out the last night. Yeah, how important is that home advantage to Newcastle? It's got to be important. They've got to make it important. It hasn't been. It hasn't been because until we got onto this little bit of a run, I mean, we lost it home to Forest and we drew it home to uh, Luton and Bournemouth. So we got two points out of nine at home against mediocre opposition. So the form at home has been distinctly iffy. But it, before that, it has always been terrific. And, you know... You can argue the fact was 3-1 down against Luton and we only got a 1-1 with Everton. So, um, you know, we, we pulled 3-1 uh, down against West Ham and only got a 1-1 with Everton. So, you know, it, it it's not rock solid. It's not rock solid. But it's going to have to be for us to, to make Europe and to, and to keep going. And, you know, this is one of the few major tests left, Andrew. There's possibly Spurs on paper, Manchester United away, although the way they're playing, they're iffy. So it's not such a great task and we've beaten them twice already this season. But, you know, this is probably the toughest match we've got left. If you look at the fixture list. No, I, I, I agree. And I was just going to ask you the next question about what expectation is on Newcastle. You know, as we mentioned at the start there, they are eighth on 47 points. But... European qualification is still very much on the cards to a degree it's in their own hands because they've still got to play Manchester United as well. Is there an, is there an expectation Newcastle United to qualify for Europe, do you think? They, Does that impact Saturday? Or, or, do you, or do you think people are coming to this thinking, well, look, we've had a horrendous season with injuries. The schedule's blown our squad apart. We've not been brilliant in recent weeks. We're still picking up form, but... I'm not expecting you. It'd be a nice boost. I, I'm I, because I'm somewhere in court in the middle, really. Yeah, and I can understand how you are because it's been just a yo-yo season. It's up and down. We, as you say, you never know from game to game what you're going to get. Whereas last season, in the main, you didn't know game to game what you were going to get, and um, you don't now. And, and and so it is very different. What is important? Yes, Europe's important. But it's what position we finish in. Having finished fourth, we don't want to finish eight, nine or ten. Regardless of the Europe situation, you want to finish six, seven or eight, don't you? Because if you tail off and finish ten, having been four last season, you know, you, regardless of Europe, you go and say, that's been poor. Um, Europe is the bonus. Europe can be done. 
But I mean, we're aiming for six or seven and seeing what that brings and what European competition it brings, etc., etc. But we owe it to ourselves. Now, the great, the Europa Cup is as good as the number two competition uh, in Europe after the Champions League. And then you can say the Conference League. Ooh, well, you know, is is that worth striving 38 games to get in the Conference League and play aside from... Um, uh, I don't know, Romania away in the, in, in the group stage and somebody else now. But I tell you what, A, it's Europe, and B, if it is the Conference League, we can win it. And that would be the first piece of silverware, unless before we win it next season, we win the FA Cup or the League Cup, it'll be the first piece of silverware in Youngs, and only the second European piece of silverware anyway. So, you know, it hasn't got the... We went out at the group stage in the Champions League. But wasn't there a great, you know, occasion? We played Paris Saint-Germain, we played AC Milan. I mean, dear, you know, you weren't, you're not playing a side from Romania or, or, or a Swiss side or something like you may be in the Conference League, but you could win that. I mean, look at the league we played in the Champions League. There's two of them in the quarterfinals of the Champions League. We beat Paris Saint-Germain 4-1 in the, in the quarterfinals of the Champions League. Bruce Hay Dortmund. Um, so we had a tough time there, but it was a wonderful time. Um, and the Conference League would not have the glamour of that. It would have the odd glamour side in. But we could win it. And, you know, you've got to be in it to win it. And we've got to win something. And we've waited long enough to win something, so let's have a crack at it. Yes, we can make Europe, mainly because we've got seven points out of nine, because it was running away from us. There's no question about that. Um, but for all we've got seven out of nine, we're not certain where we're going, that that's going to continue or it's not. We're not in, in the, the reason is injuries, of course, but it's not just injuries. That team we put out against Fulham was good enough, but it didn't look like it for the first half hour. Yeah, it didn't. And I think for me, I'd take the Europa Conference League because you want European football. You want to get the players used to playing, uh, you know, three games in a week. But I'm just thinking in terms of the, the expectation, you know, from the fans. John, do you look at Newcastle eighth and think, you know, this is a we need to win this to be in Europe, or are you just kind of taking a game, game by game, and you know, you're concentrating on the. The, the result game by game rather than the end goal of hopefully getting into Europe come out. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, Europe's in my mind all the time because if you're a big club, you're in Europe. At some level, you're in Europe. I mean, remember, West Ham went in the Conference League last year and won it. They won it and that was their first trophy in 50-odd years. They're a little bit like us. Well, if we did the same, they've got an open-top bus round these days in the London. If we did the same, we would be a little bit chuffed. And, of course, Europe's got to be in your mind. And if you're a club like Newcastle United with Saudi owners and the, the takeover, the sort of takeover we had and the expectation that come, we shouldn't go from being in the Champions League to not being in Europe at all. You, you need to be in Europe. You need the players that stay with us and to keep Bruno, Bruno and Isaac and Joe Linton and uh, people like this. You've got to play in Europe. You, you can't just play in Europe and then uh, play in the Champions League and then the next season be nowhere. You know, they, they'll say this is a yo-yo club. Maybe if I'm ambitious, I've got to go somewhere else. You know, if your club is big as we are, with the backing of the new set of owners that we've got, you in Europe every season, whatever level it's at. And therefore, I think it's very important that we do get in, into Europe this season. And it is in my mind. And it, it is... A failure not to do so, regardless mm. of injuries, or it, it it's a failure of the season if we don't make you at all. And if that is the viewpoint of of the majority of fans, and is a little bit split on social media to whether you would want the Europa Conference or you'd rather just have kind of a free shot at the league next season. But let's say the majority do want you, whichever competition it is, that does bring a a, a different kind of atmosphere to Saturday, doesn't it? And it, and that can be a positive atmosphere because yep. fans go in and they're excited. There is an expectation. There is a, a, a level of uh, demand set. You know, we want to see the best for Newcastle. We want to see them take the game to Spurs. And also, injuries aside, John, you know, Newcastle finished fourth last season. Spurs are up there now. This is another kind of test 
of Newcastle United. Okay, you, second string might be the wrong way to describe, but it's a test of Newcastle United against one of the best sides in the league. And it's it's kind of a challenge and say, okay, look, we haven't got a full roster here, but let's see what we can do when it's half there and imagine what we could do next season when it's fully there with a few more additions. Yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of players have come to Newcastle uh, originally, you know, like Trippier and, uh, and like Bruno and shortly afterwards like Pope and Bachman. Uh, this said the bought into the project. The Newcastle United long-term project, which was to be very, very successful to be regular in Europe, etc., etc. Well, if you buy into the project, you can't after one season say, oh, it's all right not to be in Europe this year because it will look better. Uh, they, we, we can have a crack at the league and maybe get fourth again and be in, in the following year. We've got to start learning to live within the pressures of a, a top four club, a top six club. They have pressures. They play regardless of injuries three matches a week. All season, the player in Europe and don't say, "Oh, we're playing a Thursday night. That's a bit awful." Oh, yes, we don't want to be in the conference because we've got to play on a Thursday night. Well, do you want to take part in the big time or do you not? You know, you you can't. Uh, it, I I don't believe that you say, "Well, we'll have a free shot at the league next season um, and and the League Cup and the FA Cup." Well, if we don't win the League Cup or the FA Cup and we will finish about fifth next season in the league. It's a wasted year. If we have, if we want to jump into the boiler and live in football's boiler, which is where the top clubs reside, then we, we keep season after season after season putting the pressure on ourselves, meeting the challenge, proving ourselves and coming up. And that's also the way you get new players. You know, the new players, you, you mightn't be in the Champions League, but you're in Europe. And that might mean you win something, and that means you're on the telly and you're in the big games, and you're not a and other, you know. And um, when when Liverpool had that awful season last year, the uh, the awful season meant they didn't play in the Champions League, but they still played in Europe. And look at the way they've flown this year in all competitions, etc., etc. You've got to stay in the major queue. You've got to stay shopping at Harrods and not going to the corner shop. And, and you know, I think it's important to Newcastle and all the Newcastle players and Isaac's young and Gordon's young and uh, as well as being very talented to learn to live in that hot house because that is what top football is all about. No, I totally agree. It's about belonging, isn't it? Believing that you belong yes. at the yes. top tier. Well, that's what Newcastle United have got to start thinking like. Uh, I just want to ask you, though, about uh, some comments from James Madison of Spurs. And we're talking about expectation from a Newcastle point of view. And now, as we said, Spurs have just gone at the top four um, ahead of Aston Villa, 60 points each. But James Madison this week has said, it's annoying, really, listening to three teams go at it for the title and we are not in it, especially after the start of the season we had. That's something that gives us good motivation to want to be in the title race next year, seeing how good it is this year. It is frustrating not to be part of that, but we are where we are and we have our own job to do. Now, I'm just wondering your take on those comments, John, because he's airing his frustration publicly. But I, despite the way they started the season, I never looked at Tottenham at the same level of a City, a Liverpool or even an Arsenal. You know, They started the season well, but they were never going to be out and out title challenges. And I'm just thinking that do those comments put a bit of extra pressure on Spurs on Saturday, given the games are running out, given Aston Villa are still chasing them down for that top four football. If, if their star players coming out and saying that about challenging for the title, then that's that's got to put an extra pressure on you and that's got to work in Newcastle's advantage for Saturday. Or, as I suspect you might say, do you want your star players saying that openly and publicly? and saying, I want to be challenged for the title. I'm not happy that we're not. Well, I hope it does put pressure on the Spurs on Saturday for our sake. But no, I, I, I honestly believe this is a new signing, a big signing that's come in the club. And I think he's not, he is saying, you know, it's disappointing after a great start to find where we are and sit and watch three clubs battle it out for the title. But I think what he's really saying is we've got to do that Next season or the season that we've got to do that's we we can't be 
patting ourselves on the back because we might make the Champions League from fourth. Spurs should be doing better. Spurs haven't won anything for Yonks, of course, but they're a big club, and we're a big club. But I want my players to be saying things like that. And what he's saying subconsciously to, in, in the dressing room, he's saying, if there's any of you lot that don't feel like that, you should be ashamed of yourself because that's the way we should feel. You're only going to get better if you want to be better. You know, we finished fourth top last season. I'm certain Eddie Al made certain there was nobody in that dressing room that said that that was great. We can now get the big cigars out because if we finish fourth every season and just have a little run in the Champions League and get to the quarter final of the domestic cups, haven't we done well? You've got to have more ambition than that. If you know, you can't pretend you're a big club, call yourself a big club if you don't think like a big club. And and I think Madison is right to say, come on. You know, don't pat ourselves on the back. We aren't in that three. Um, I don't think he really means he expected to be this season, but he, what he really means is I don't want to keep watching them three battling it out. I want to be in there with Spurs battling it out myself. And he should be thinking that. And if there's anybody in the Spurs camp that isn't thinking like that, then they shouldn't be in the Spurs camp. I would like to think we think like that. Uh, you know, interesting, think- John. I, I gotta say, I didn't think that would be your answer because I don't know. For me, that's a, it's a very unrealistic comment from James Madison. I've read it as that he thinks they should have been challenging for the title this season. And you and I can disagree on on how we interpret it, but I do think it's an unre- unrealistic uh, hope from him this season, maybe even next season. And you say there, obviously, Eddie Howe wouldn't allow anyone to get the big cigars out after challenging for the top four. But at the same time, I don't think Eddie Howe would have allowed anyone to think. You know, next season, lads, as in the season we're playing now, or we'll be challenging for the title because it's just a totally unrealistic hope. If you and don't might have be... ambition, you get nowhere. And no, if you it's don't be aim realistic, for the stars, it? if you don't aim for the stars, you'll never get to the stars. You, 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 if you get on a on a rocket that's going to go to the moon and you're quite willing to bail out before it gets into outer space, that's where you live and that's where you reside and that's where you'll spend your life. You have got to have, I tell you what, the season before last season, talking about Newcastle United, the season before last season when we fought off a relegation fight, you know, would it have been unrealistic to think we'll finish fourth and play in a Wembley final? Of course it was unrealistic, but we did it. We did it. When we, in the season, we had Bruno and Trippier just joining us and and we, we got comfortable you know we didn't go down but we that was it that was all we did under that first little Eddie Howe thing if we had said at that end of the season this season there's no reason why we won't finish four top go in the Champions League and play in a domestic cup final people who said well that's a bit unrealistic let's let's establish ourselves about 10th, 9th or 8th first and then think of that the following season. But actually, that's what we did. Now, if you put a glass ceiling on your hopes and you think, well, that's really unrealistic, let's not go for that. I'll tell you the biggest certainty, you certainly won't get it if you if you do that. And we went from being a relegation side that saw off relegation because we'd signed Trippier and Bruno and we had a new manager and new owners and we the next season, we'll finish fourth top Champions League and play the Wembley. That was unrealistic. This might be unrealistic for Spurs, but if they finish fourth and they're a little step further down the road than us, of course, the greatest, the, the hardest steps are always once you get to fourth, going third, second or first, as opposed to being bottom and coming up a little bit. But, you know, give me somebody without ambition and give me somebody that hasn't got a reason to live. No, I take your point. I take your point. And you guys watching, listen, let us know in the comments and on social media what you think about the little debate that we've just had there. Uh, John, before I get your score prediction, I just want to read through a few comments that I've had in. I asked our listeners and viewers uh, prior to recording what they're expecting of Saturday. And I'll just read through a, a few, and uh, then you can you can jump on whatever you, you like, John, from what you hear from me. Um, Ando says, not the 6-1 humping of uh, last season, that's for sure. So, again, the question was, what are you expecting on Saturday? 
Uh, Chris says, hopefully Newcastle turn up for the first half an hour for a change. We're more than good enough to give them a game, but not if we crawl out of the blocks like we did against Fulham. Ben says, I think we'll get plenty of chances, especially if, uh, especially should we play Barnes, Isaac and Gordon. So he's gone for your fun free, John. That always gives you a chance. It'll be a big test for Hall and he's hoping Tino will be back. Eric's not too optimistic. He says, unfortunately, I think we will lose. We were fortunate to beat West Ham and Fulham. The victories have papered over the cracks. If we turn up like we did for the first 30 minutes at Fulham, the game will be out of sight. Jerome says, if clinical, we win. He talks about the Forest game and thinks the scoreline flattered Spurs. Um, we've got Lambeth, Mag, saying it's going to be a very difficult, difficult game. This isn't the same week Spurs we faced last season and we aren't as strong with three points needed. And I am hopeful. And Clayton says, we need the points. They need the points. So I'm expecting it to be an attacking end-to-end -end game. And Ricky <laughs> rather optimistically says 6-1 again. So, John, <laughs> you know, a lot of people referencing, as we've done, the start against Fulham and just saying you cannot start like that against Tottenham because they'll get at you. But at the same time, they're a good side, but they're not unbeatable. They have their flaws. Newcastle totally. have a chance here if they play to the best of their own ability. Without a shadow of doubt. Um, I mean, they're not one of the top three um, that we've talked about. Uh, but mind you, let us remember, in passing, because we always put ourselves down because we, we're so concerned about Newcastle. Let, let us remember, we've beaten Arsenal and Manchester City this season. Manchester City, albeit in the League Cup, but we beat Arsenal up here one 0 So we 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 have done well against the top teams, and 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 Spurs aren't as good as that. They, they, you've got to give Spurs credit. I mean, when everything changed at the end of last season, and I think they're much better side than the six-one side. When things changed at the end of last season, the cynics were saying Spurs without Harry Kane, oh, they're going to be in big trouble, etc., etc., without Kane scores. As far as Big Hands is concerned, they said, oh, well, he, I mean, he flattered to deceive at Celtic. They only had Rangers to, to beat uh, to win the title. The, the rest of the league is not at the races. And while that's all true, um, the new manager's got them the feel-good factor back. He's put Spurs on the front foot, which is the way they play by tradition, as Eddie Howe's put us on the front foot, uh, in, instead of the break being on, like it was under Steve Bruce. And they're managing very nicely without Kane, because Son has blossomed into the wonderful player he is. Madison is absolutely terrific. Rich Allison's about to come back, possibly on the bench. And, and they've got to fourth. But by the way, let me just add as an aside, the reason we have done them a big favour already this season, so we don't want to do them any favour on Saturday. The big favour we've done them is that they're only fourth because we took six points out of Aston Villa. If we hadn't taken six points out of Aston Villa, they wouldn't be fourth um, because Villa would be fourth and clear. So we've done them that favour. We're not going to do any more favours. And um, I think of all those remarks that you read out, and I agreed with an awful lot of them, apart from the last one, that we can do 6-1 again, bless them. I, I love fancy island stuff, mate. But um, I don't think that's going to quite happen. But a lot of what was said is true, and a lot re-emphasised what we said it, up top in this podcast, which is Newcastle have got to start fast, which is one of the reasons I was talking about playing Bonds from the start rather than later. We've got to start fast. If we start like we did with Forrest, we won't be able to change. It's harder to change it at home it, because the crowd becomes flat. It becomes dull. You can hear the little ripples of apprehension. Natural. And that's being felt by the players in themselves without the crowd. You start on the front foot and the crowd will go up a height and you will go up a height and Spurs will start taking in water. Everything depends on the first 20 minutes against Spurs. After 20 yeah. minutes, I think we'll all know, if not what the score is going to be, if not, do we win? But we know we're not going to lose if, if we start in the right frame of mind. We've got to start right. They are vulnerable. They're not as good. I mean, the, the top three are a different class to the rest of the league, regardless of whether it's Aston Villa or Spurs who are fourth, um, Manchester United a while back, etc. The top three are up and away. Uh, 
but these aren't world beaters as we said about Fulham they're better than Fulham but they're not world beaters uh, how do I think it'll go well if we pick the right team um, and hopefully we will pick the right team uh, it would be nice to have a right back we'll stick with Kraft if if not uh, I think we we'll probably won't have a right back um, somebody might be fit that we're not expecting whether it's Wilson for the bench etc but my biggest concern Andrew is nobody's not fit you know when he doesn't tell us about injuries and then all of a sudden we get the team sheet now and a bit before kickoff and there's no whoever because he's suddenly got a fitness problem or he's been ill you know that's what would hit us hard if we're not faced with anything like that i think it'll be a nip and tuck game because i think it'll be a, a front foot game because both sides attack and then to a certain extent that's all the they know what to do. And I think it will be that way. I think both sides will score. And I think we'll nick it 2-1. Well, I'll take it. I'm expecting goals most certainly. And I agree with you. We've got to come out the blocks, uh, out the traps really quickly and set the tone. You know, get a get a feisty challenge and get an early goal like they did against Everton. And just make sure they build on it. But the early goal will set the tone and the crowd will course be behind them uh, just before we finish some excellent news has just landed in my inbox so last year we were crowned the best sport podcast uh, by the publisher podcast awards and the nominations are out for this year and we've picked up uh, another two nominations john uh, we're going back in for our crown of best sport podcast which is excellent we are going up against the Clout and Blue podcast made by our Midlands colleagues. Um, so I'm sure the, the overall bosses will be happy that the odds are maybe on Reach's favour, but uh, I don't want to give me crown up that easily. And we're also up against Clout and Blue uh, for best video strategy as well, which is great news. And then um, I'm also up for podcast hero of the year. So um, I'll take all three nominations. Uh, thank you to John for all the work he does. Thanks to Aaron. Thanks to Lee. Thanks to all the guests we have on. And more importantly, thanks to you guys watching and listening. Because without you guys, we wouldn't have the audience to put the content out to. You guys keep pushing us to reach the levels uh, to you know allow us to get these wonderful nominations. But that's excellent news to sign off, isn't it, John? It's absolutely wonderful. I'm chuffed to, to bits for you and uh, for the Chronicle and for everybody that's involved in it. And, you know, you, you talk about Clarets and Blues in the, the Middle Ends and we've took six points off Aston Villa this season, man. There's three wards are in the bag. That's what I was going to say. I've just texted my, my colleague, Dan, who was, uh, he does a little bit, when I'm off, he does a little bit behind the scenes for us. He'll upload the podcast if, I've, if I'm off on, on my holidays. And I just said, well, you you came for Newcastle's fourth place this season. It looked like you were going to get it, but you've just slightly, slightly tailed off. So if it happens with this, these awards, we'll we'll take it. But yeah, we'll find out in June down in London if we've managed to uh, reclaim our crown. It's going to be a close one, but you often say get nominated is the hardest part of the job. So uh, we, we've done it. So thanks to John. And as I say, thanks to everyone else involved. And, and we, let, let us, yeah. I've always said with awards, Andrew, that getting nominated is an award in itself yeah you know i mean everybody wants to finish just first but to be in that select group is something special to start with so you know everything's a plus from now on in that's that's terrific certainly is and there's some some big names in the mix sky sports in there as well and um twice in there so we're gonna we're gonna have, we're gonna have a work cut out but uh yeah looking forward to that but uh hopefully Newcastle can pick up the win against Spurs on Saturday and give their European chances a huge boost in the final run. And this has been the Everything is Black and White podcast, the match preview with myself, Andrew Musgrove and John Gibson. Hit like, hit like, follow, subscribe, leave us a rating and review and head over to chroniclelive.co.uk for all the latest Newcastle United news, including Eddie Howe's press conference on Friday morning and live coverage of this very game through our dedicated Match Day Live blog on Saturday afternoon, 12.30 kickoff. And for myself and John, we'll see you guys next week.